Good morning, family. My name is Lisa, and I'm one of the pastors here at Christ City Church. We are wrapping up our psalm series today. Uh, the, the, the title of the series has been Strength for the Journey. This has been another week where I have needed some strength because the journey has been hard. As a church engaged in the work of justice and compassion, this series has helped us collectively find ongoing strength and resolve for the work ahead. Beyond that, on a more individual level, settling in the Psalms has been a reminder that our efforts at displaying God's coming um, kingdom and works, our works of worship. Our hope is that through this series, we would remember together the connection between justice and compassion, worship, um, and from that vantage point, find refreshment in the Lord. Our passage for today is Psalm 150. All the kids have uh, been so joyful and incredible and, and actually have been a relief for me from the heaviness of this week. Can I be honest? Um, I haven't had a Psalm 150 kind of week. Joyful shouts of hallelujah and, and praise the Lord just haven't been my space. The juxtaposition between my experiences this week feels really at odds with the hallelujah chorus of Psalm 150. And frankly, I wrestled significantly with how to preach this particular psalm after such a difficult week. I wrestled especially with how I will speak the words of the Spirit's comfort and godly anger to the African-American men in our church, to the wives, and daughters and sisters of black men, and to the mothers of black sons, given the exhaustion and despair that has likely settled on your souls again. If I could have chosen a psalm to preach this week, it would have been Psalm 13. How long, O oh Lord? This agonizing question begins Psalm 13, a, a passage that has been my heart's cry as I agonized over the shooting of another unarmed black man at the hands of white officers, leaving him hospitalized and paralyzed. When Jacob Blake awoke from the surgery that saved his life but not his ability to walk, his father was holding him and he wept and cried into his father's arms, sobbing, why did they shoot me so many times, Dad? Why? In the aftermath of the shooting, the brutality and rage flooding across my screen has stirred in me at times despair and desperation. How long do we have to endure a duplicitous system that takes lethal action towards an empty-handed black man while offering gratitude and gifts to white men walking the streets with military-grade weapons and murderous intent? Jacob Blake and the terrible aftermath of the unraveling of Kenosha wasn't the only hard thing that happened this week. There was Hurricane Laura that devastated parts of Louisiana. And there was also the shocking loss of Chadwick Boseman to his battle with cancer, a hero on screen and off. This week, we saw the effects of unchecked political and religious power play out in the deplorable saga of the Falwells, folks whose intoxication with power have made a scandalous and public mockery of our faith. Honestly, these are only the things that have made the news. I know there's been sorrow for you this week, for things in your family life, there have been disappointments on the work front, financial hardships of many kinds, health issues that have taken turns that you hadn't imagined that they would take. We're still in the midst of pandemic life and, and all the struggles that that brings. And well, it's still 2020 with all its... So yeah, <laughs> it's been a Psalm 13 kind of week. And how long, O oh Lord, has been my prayerful refrain. With the psalmist, I have asked, how long? How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. 
give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will, will rejoice when I fall. And even as I found resonance with the earnest pleading in the how long phrases of this psalm, I needed the end of the psalm to help me understand how to preach Psalm 150 today. The psalmist takes a difficult but important and powerful turn in verses 5 and 6. He starts with two short but potent words, but I. It is important to note that in no way do these words negate the previous longing and grief, but they do indicate a choice and a turn towards agency that is critical to notice. Two small words with great significance. But I, right in the midst of all that has troubled me and you and us in our country, but I, agency, and choice, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. There is a tone of determined resolve, a persistence that refuses resignation and acknowledges the complexity of wholehearted worship that beckons us to bring sorrow and grief and praise. There's the holding of two different things together that are both true at once. Where the psalmist begins is not where the psalmist ends. All of it matters. All of it is worship. The same is true when we examine Psalm 150. While it is a standalone psalm that exhorts us to praise the Lord, it comes in the context of the rest of the book of Psalms. It's significant that Psalm 150 isn't the beginning or isn't at the beginning or in the middle of the book of Psalms. It is the very last psalm on purpose. A few years ago, Justin preached a sermon on Psalm 1 and 150 when our church was going through a different series in the book of Psalms. He offered insight, which I found helpful. He said, all the Psalms prior to this one seem like an exercise in what happens when everything falls apart, when things don't turn out the way they should, when the righteous don't prosper and the wicked don't perish, when we obey and seem worse off instead of better off, when we don't see the joy of our salvation, but instead experience the death of our dreams, when friends and family turn against us, when we struggle to find our place in this world and purpose for our lives. Psalm 150 is the capstone of all the Psalms. It is a call to abundant, joyous, and exuberant expressions of praise, not because the sorrow, all the sorrow has disappeared or because the challenges have been removed. Psalm 150 is a call to praise the Lord because of who God is, not because everything is right in the world. Psalm 150 reads, praise the Lord, that's hallelujah. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Walter Brueggemann comments in his book, The Psalms and the Life of Faith. He says, Psalm 150 is remarkable because it contains no reason or motivation for praise at all. It is the only psalm that completely lacks motivation. It is the most extreme and unqualified statement of unfettered praise in the Old Testament. Psalm 150 is situated literally at the end of the process of praise. It is also located theologically at the end of the process of praise and obedience after all of Israel's motivations have been expressed and no more reasons need to be given. Psalm 150, by Psalm 150, Israel fully knows the reasons for praise. Perhaps 
learned through the course of the Book of Psalms. Beyond Psalm 150's location in the Psalter in the Book of Psalms, I was, I was comforted this week when it occurred to me that the Book of Psalms is appropriately found between a book about suffering and a book about wisdom. Worship that includes lament and sorrow and fear and exasperation and anger and joy and praise is the language of Psalms. Worship is how we rightly navigate suffering. Worship is how we attain wisdom. The Psalms are our, are our strength for the journey in both. Now to be clear, worship is more than being able to just name and feel our feelings of lament and praise and anger and exasperation. Those are certainly important if we're going to be emotionally healthy. The difference though between feeling our feelings and worship is that we engage in that vulnerable awareness and ownership of our thoughts and emotions in the presence of an all-knowing and completely loving God. There's a Hebrew word, hesed, that doesn't actually have a good English translation, but the concept is one of loyal, loving, faithful presence, proven in action over time. We see sometimes, um, we see it in the scripture translated as loving kindness. It is in our struggle with God and bringing our pain and our honest emotions to God and crying out to God for justice and deliverance that we are able to experience the hesed, the loving kindness, the faithful presence proven in action over time of God. It's how the psalmist was able to transition in Psalm 13 from how long, O oh Lord, to but I will trust. It's how at the end of all the psalms, the people of God are able to engage in such enthusiastic praise. They had experienced the faithfulness and goodness of God. And now that we have plenty of context for Psalm 150, there are several things that bear noting within the passage. The who, the where, and the why of praise. First, it's obvious that the one being praised, the object of the praise in verse one and verse six is the Lord. It seems almost silly to mention at this point. However, we have to be intentional in a world that offers a million options for us to worship. To be sure, there are some really good things in each of our lives. There are things that deserve praise and acknowledgement. However, our worship should be reserved for God alone. The temptation will exist for us to worship other things. A partner, our work, wealth, kids, friends, education, politics or politicians, maybe even your pastor. We cannot devote our allegiance to or attempt to find ultimate satisfaction in any of these. They will eventually disappoint and leave us more spiritually depleted. As we seek strength for our journey, it is so important for us to bear in mind that we were created to worship our creator and God, and he alone is worthy of our worship. So the who of our worship is clear. The second half of verse one defines the where. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. And the first part of the verse is fairly obvious as to where we praise God. Back in biblical times, the place would have been in the temple in Jerusalem. It was the place on earth where God chose to dwell among his people, where they went to worship God. Today, we know that God indwells each one of us as believers through the Holy Spirit, so it's a bit different. Nonetheless, there's an earthly context to worship. The second phrase, praise him in his mighty heavens, makes reference to the sky and everything within it and below it. It's a reference to the eternal and also what is already going on in heaven. 
What's interesting to me here is the heaven and earth connections in these phrases. It calls to mind the Lord's Prayer when we pray, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. A little more than a year ago, I, I, went on, um, I went to the Holy Land with a team from our church. And um, one breezy late afternoon, we made a trip to the Wailing Wall in the heart of Jerusalem. It wasn't crowded, but there were people praying on both the men and the women's sides. And I approached the wall, not really knowing what to pray. Once I was there with my hand on the wall, the only thing that came to my mind with clarity was the Lord's Prayer. After having spent time earlier in the Holocaust Museum, being reminded of the atrocities of genocide, of the brutal, ruthless realities that came as a result of unhindered and state-sanctioned supremacy, the only prayer I could pray was, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I continued to pray that prayer in the days that followed as I learned more about the suffering of the Palestinians at the hands of the Israelis and the seemingly insurmountable division between the two people groups sharing that same land. I couldn't muster my own words of praise and prayer at the Wailing Wall, so I borrowed the prayer of Jesus that connected the will and reality of heaven and earth. When you and I praise on earth, it is an action that is mirroring what is already going on in heaven. What if praise filled our lives as praise fills the halls of heaven? Wouldn't that be amazing? When we feel like we may not have strength for the journey of seeking justice and compassion in our city and in our world, praising the Lord may give us the strength we need. In the times when we don't have words of our own, we can find solace in praising the honorable and hallowed name of God and praying for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Finally, we get to the why of praise in Psalm 150. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. We're called to praise God for what he does. What are some of his acts of power? I'll name three. Creation. God created the world and, ma and made humanity in God's image. Redemption. God provided a way for humanity to be reconciled to God and be in relationship with God through Jesus. God put on flesh for us and gave himself up for us and then resurrected to have power even over death. That's a mighty act of power. Finally, renewal. God is making all things new. Someday all the brokenness and all the pain and all the suffering will end because God is working restoration in all things even now. Isaiah 9, 7 reminds us with hope that his government and its peace will never end, amen. His rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David, oh sorry, he will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passion and commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. God is to be praised for his acts of power. I'm sure you can attest some great, to some great things that God has done for you. In fact, Last week, we shared a number of testimonies in our service about God's goodness towards us. Psalm 150 encourages us to praise God for his acts of power, for what he does. But the following phrase exhorts us to praise him for who he is no matter what he does. Years ago, I did a Bible study led by Priscilla Shire and she preached the attributes of God through each book of the Bible so good that I wanted to share it with you this morning. She's a pretty good preacher, so she really rocked this one. But here it is. In Genesis, he's the breath of life. In Exodus, he is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is our high priest. In Numbers, the fire by night. Deuteronomy, he is Israel's guide. 
Joshua, he is salvation's choice. Judges, he is Israel's guard. And Ruth, the kinsman's redeemer. First and second Samuel, our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he is sovereign. In Ezra, he is the true and faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, rebuilder of broken walls and lives. In Esther, in Esther he is Mordecai's courage. In Job, the timeless redeemer. In Psalms, he is our morning song. In Proverbs, he is our wisdom. Ecclesiastes, he is the time and season. In Song of Solomon, he is the lover's dream. In Isaiah, he is the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Lamentations, the cry for Israel. Ezekiel, the call from sin. Daniel, the stranger in the fire. Hosea, the forever faithful. Joel, the spirit's power. Amos, the strong arms that carry. Obadiah, the Lord, our savior. Jonah, the great missionary. Micah, the promise of peace. Nahum, our strength and shield. In Habakkuk and Sephaniah, he brings revival. In Haggai, he restores that which was lost. In Zechariah, he is our fountain. And in Malachi, he's the son of righteousness, rising with healing in his wings and that's just the Old Testament. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he is God and Messiah. In the Spirit-filled book of Acts, he is the raining fire from heaven. In Romans, he is the grace of God. Corinthians, the power of love. Galatians, freedom from the curse of sin. Ephesians, our glorious treasure. Philippians, the servant's heart. Colossians, he is God and Trinity. Thessalonians, our calling king. In Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, he is our mediator and our faithful pastor. In Hebrews, the everlasting courage. In First and Second Peter, our faithful shepherd. In John and Jude, he is the lover coming for his bride. And in the Revelation, in the very end when it's all over, said and done, when time is no more, he is and always will be King of kings and Lord of lords, Prince of peace, Son of man, Lamb of God, the great I am, Alpha and Omega, God and Savior. He is Jesus Christ the Lord. He is everything you need. He is everything I need. He is everything we need. Psalm 150 is a wonderful reminder to praise. The book of Psalms ends with a call for everything that has breath to praise the Lord. Maybe you're still not ready for praise. The beauty of the Psalms is that they are sung communally, sung together. The people of Israel would express these words as one, meaning that even if someone may not have been feeling that particular Psalm in that particular moment, they would sing it nonetheless as an expression of solidarity and presence with those who were. That's what it looks like to rejoice with those who rejoice, and to mourn with those who mourn. Given all the hardships of today and this week and this year, it may take time for some of us to get to praise from lament and grief. But being in the company of believers who are reminding us of the truth of God's reign may be the North Star we need and may be the exact strength for our journey that we've been longing for. Will you pray with me? Lord, sometimes when we come before you, we can come easily with exuberant praise. I think Psalm 150 was such a perfect psalm for this week, God, because It's a reminder that you're worthy of our praise despite the things that are going on around us because of who you are, God. Not when it's easy to praise. Remind us of the truth of your chesed, of your unfaithful, of your faithful, unending love. 
Thank you that we can come with all of who we are, all of our emotions, even if it's a meager, small moment of praise, you receive it as worship, and we are grateful for that. And God, continue to bless us as we, as we finish out our worship service, as we take communion. We love you, Lord. We are honored to be called your people. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.